but of the living, for all live to him. He doesn't want a bunch of dead bodies out there. He wants people that are alive and, and walking and what is the basis for life? Chaya. His name, Yahweh, comes from what? The root word Chaya, which means to have life or to exist or to be. But we'll get into that here in a minute. Go back to... <clears throat> well, I, what I'll try to get back to the bush was not consumed by fire. The fire came from the midst of the bush, okay? <clears throat> in looking at the bush, and what I'm looking at is kind of a picture of Yahweh living in us. This whole thing Messiah is speaking about, and he's speaking about the words that came, that he's not the Elohim of the dead, but the Elohim of the living, right? And this voice of life, the word, the Torah, came out of the bush, okay? Go to Proverbs 20. Uh... In verse uh, 27, the spirit of a man is the lamp or the light of Yahweh. Okay? Searching all the inner depths of his heart. In Hebrew, that's searching all the rooms of the belly, you know, coming out of him. So that's this lamp, this light. He told, you know, over in Matthew, and he says, you are the light of the world. You know, let your light shine, right? Moses went up to look at this bush because of the light that radiated from the fire that was coming out of it, right? Yahweh's word is the fire, is it not? If we have light coming out of us and that light is his word, is that not the fire of Yahweh coming out of us? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, get us something to see here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> and... Uh, Verses 10 through 11, this, uh, this chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, as everybody you know, that knows or you know, we've ever talked about, this is a very highly charged chapter anyway, talking about spiritual things concerning the Word and so forth. But in verse 10 it says, But Yahweh has revealed to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of Yahweh. Now let's back up to verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which Yahweh has prepared for those who love him. And what is this loving of him? Obedience to him. Okay. Verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of Yahweh except the spirit of Yahweh. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from Yahweh, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by Yahweh. The only way we can know those things is by His Spirit, right? Which is His breath. The only thing that we can know is what this Word tells us. His Spirit is this Word speaking to us. When we accept it and receive it. Believe it. Now go back to Acts chapter 7. <laughs> In, uh, starting in verse 30. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of Yahweh, now how long had he been down in Midian? 40 years. It's funny, we read these passages in just a few minutes, you know, and yet in, as far as the actual taking place, a lot of time takes place. When forty years had passed, an angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of Yahweh came to him, saying, I am, now he's quoting directly from Exodus 3, and in Exodus 3, the word used there for God is the word Elohim. 
saying, I am the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov. And Moshe trembled and dared not look. Then Yahweh said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moshe, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one Yahweh sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. The one who was sent, the one who was sent as the, the, uh, the giver of the law, is also the one who was sent to deliver. In what's called the New Testament, we talk about this marriage and everything, and the bridegroom comes for a bride. Well, who's the one supposed to deliver the bride to the bridegroom? Moshe, the Torah, the deliverer. He's the one that delivers the bride, a spotless bride to the bridegroom. The bridegroom's coming back for a spotless bride, is he not? How do we get to be a spotless bride if we keep breaking Torah all the time and just, you know, fluffing it off, say, oh, we're, gonna, we're back, we're under grace? You know, I found favor in his sight, you know. He gave me a lollipop two weeks ago. I know that's being facetious, okay? But then so many things that people say to us is facetious. Okay. <clears throat> Go back. The same Moses they refused was sent by the angel in the bush to show us the way of deliverance and how to become the bride. Do you see how that, that all makes sense? The one who was drawn out of the water is the one who's showing us how to be drawn out. He's giving us the instructions on how to live so that we can what? Become the bride of the Mashiach. And who is the friend of the bridegroom? <laughs> who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration when Messiah was, was you know, Moshe and Elijah? Those things are prophesied of him to come. And they appeared, what, to strengthen him. What he drew his strength from was from the, the lawgiver and the prophets. Why wouldn't it work for us? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so in verse 3, it said, Then Moshe said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. He was drawn to the light. He was drawn to the fire. And he said, But there's something wrong here. The bush burns, but it's not consumed. I've got to go find out why. So when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to look, El called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, he named him. Here I am. <clears throat> if you can get a hold of this, here's Moshe sees this bush up there that's burning and all he's saying about it, I got to go find out why that bush, you know, ain't, uh, you know. And then when he gets up there, this voice calls to him. This man has got to be, I mean, I know he was raised and he was probably taught some by Yoshebed, his parents and everything, and, and you know, Aaron, his sister, and his sister. But still, he was raised then in, in Egypt, right? He was, all the wisdom and everything of Egypt, we're going to read about him. But all of a sudden, he goes up looking at this bush and a voice speaks to him out of the bush. Right? I mean, what would you do if you walked up to a bush and something spoke to you out of the bush? <laughs> Somebody pull a gun and shoot the bush or blood or something. <laughs> you know, all kinds of things would happen in our society, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we have a, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but I mean, just try to apply that in, in today's life, right? And Yahweh is very capable of the same thing today he did right then. We're not always looking, though, for where he's going to be. Elijah heard a still, small voice, did he? I mean, he saw a storm came in, whirlwind, all this kind of thing, but Yahweh wasn't in that, and then finally heard this small voice, right? We're always looking for Yahweh instead of where he is. You ever think about that? <clears throat> Verse 5, then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. 
when Yahweh saw Moses turn to seek him or to see him, then he spoke to him. He said, when you seek me with all your heart, he said, I'll be found of you, right? When Moses went to seek, then Yahweh spoke. Did Moses not have ever gone up and see the bush? He wouldn't have heard the voice. Who steps first? He said, you draw near to me and I'll draw nigh to you. You go away from me and he's going, I'm going to go away from you. We have a choice. <laughs> In verse 5, the word shoes or sandals is the number 5275. It's the word not all. Literally in the Hebrew, it means a sandal tongue. <laughs> you know, as, as a little tongue, you know, in a, in a sandal, you know, that covers the top part of the foot, you know. <clears throat> By extension, it means a sandal or a slipper. Sometimes it is seen and used as a symbol of occupancy. Sometimes, depending on how it's used, it's used as a refusal to marry. Or sometimes it's used as a symbol of something valueless. But shoes were not considered a part of the priestly garments. Different place Yahweh was when somebody came up, first thing he said, well, take off your shoes for you're on holy ground. He was going to be in the tabernacle, right? And he wouldn't let the priest wear the shoes. He was in the temple and they couldn't wear shoes. Wherever Yahweh is, is holy ground. <clears throat> shoes are to make the way path or make the pathway smooth for the feet of those after they leave from his presence. Go to Psalm 25. <clears throat> In uh, Psalm 25, In verse 10, all the paths of Yahweh are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimony. Remember in Isaiah talks a man whose feet are shod with the what? The gospel of peace. <laughs> the gospel, the good news, the word. <clears throat> Go to Isaiah 2. In Isaiah chapter 2, and in verse 3, many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the Elohim of Yaakov. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Yerushalayim. If the Torah is going out of Zion and it's the word, then the word and the Torah must be the same, the word of Yahweh. And the Torah is the same. Is that not what it's saying? It's going to go out from where? From Jerusalem. What's the only place in the world where he chose to put his name? And he told Solomon to build a house for what? For his name? <laughs> Go to the book of Micah, Micah, chapter 4. Micah, in chapter 4, in verse 2. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the Elohim of Yaakov. He will teach us his ways. And we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion the Torah shall go forth, and the word of Yahweh from Yerushalayim. It's the same thing as said in Isaiah. When someone was in the presence of Yahweh himself, take off his shoes, for where you stand is holy ground. You don't need that protection there, right? When you get out in his presence, you walk in the shoes, which is walking in the word of Torah, because that is your pathway to follow him. And then way our path, then our feet are shod with the what? Preparation of the gospel, the good news of peace. And who is the king of peace? Jehoshua, Sar Shalom, the prince of peace. And he come back as our king. 
You see what I'm saying? All these things, all these little bitty symbols which we just read over so fast and don't really, you know, notice, you know. Each one of them has a little bitty, you know, it's a, it's a plug-in, a piece of the whole picture that fits in the puzzle. Going back to the, to the bush. <clears throat> Again in verse 5, Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. You need the shoes outside. That protects you. Then in verse 6, Moreover he said, Ani, Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Yaakov, and Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon Elohim. <clears throat> Remember, over in, in, the, in the, we're going to read it in Mark, you know, where they're quoting from this passage, and, and they say the Lord and everything, we can go right back and take this word Elohim and put it right back over there in that passage because it's a direct translation. In verse 7, and Yahweh said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them, 53.37, not Saul, for I have come down to snatch them away out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Yebusites. The appointed time has come, okay? Now stop and think about something. All Moses has ever known is what? Egypt and Midian. Right? <laughs> Did Moses ever enter the land of Israel? He never did, did he? been all his life in Egypt and Midian and then wandering <laughs> for 40 years of it, you know. Don't you know how that, he knew he was called to deliver the people and yet he goes to try to deliver the people and because of unbelief they wouldn't go in. A journey that should have taken no more than two weeks took 40 years. And yet Moses, what, did he stay with it? I know there's times that he didn't really feel like it, you know. You know, them people, you know, your people, the ones you gave me, you know. Everybody, everybody reaches a point in time. I mean, even, you know, we can, we can feel comforted. It happened to Moses, okay? But he didn't quit. And we have to always remember that. You might reach a point in time where you feel like it, but you don't do it. Verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. <laughs> A commission to bring the people out of Egypt. Okay? And he said, I will send you to Pharaoh. Okay? <clears throat> He's going to deliver them. And then he's going to give the people instructions on how to live after he brings them out. I don't know why people have such a trouble saying we are delivered out of the world today and then we come back and through Moshe he gives us the instructions on how we're supposed to live. And through those instructions we came to know the Messiah, you know, the one that we follow into the promised land. Right? And in case we, you know, we missed that in the first place, we go to Messiah and what does he do? He sends us back to the Torah. <laughs> We're going to get the same, you know, instruction, the same education, as long as we don't follow some type of false thing that says, oh, well, he's replaced everything and nothing else matters anyway. Because without him, what is there? Nothing. What if without the word, there is no him? That's right. So it's the same thing. <clears throat> Go to Matthew 28. In... Uh, Eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. When we go to Messiah, and remember, we came to Him, and we're really knowing who He is through the words of Moshe, right? We come to Him in verse, uh, verse, verse eighteen. Then Yehoshua came and spoke to them, saying, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples or students of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son in the spirit of holiness. Or if you want to say of the Holy Spirit, depending on how the text reads, okay? But he's going to what? Make disciples or students of all the nations, immersing, making them what? Fully wet. That's what the word baptized means. In the name of. In Revelation, when he comes back and he's on a white horse, and it says his name is what? Called what? The Word of Yahweh. Go over to Revelation. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll tell you in just a minute. Is it 1913? Is that it? Okay. Yeah, Revelation 19. In verse 11, 11 through 13, it says, Then I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yahweh. How do we get immersed in the name? The name is all this word. Yahweh is his memorial, but the rest of this word describes who he is. That's who he is. That's his true name. We are immersed in that word. We are immersed in his name. <clears throat> Go back to uh, 18.4. Just, you know, before we leave Revelation here. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Coming out of who? Coming out of Babylon. Coming out of confusion, right? What does the word Babel mean? Confusion. Coming out of the world. Where can you find... <coughs> Three or four or five great religions, all built on the same Bible. One of these religions, like Judaism, and how many different denominations are there within that religion, all based on one Bible. And then you have Christianity, which is another, you know, religion, and how many different denominations do you have in that, all based on one Bible. And then you have one called Islam, and they all claim they believe the same, you know, same Bible, same God, you know, Abraham. And yet there are so many differences. Somebody don't believe something. I mean, how can there be that many differences when it's all one word? And I know we have a lot of different translations, but if you, you know, put it all down and start matching up the different translations, they're all going to say the same thing. They're all going to bring you back to the same place. All goes back to the word of Yahweh, the Torah, to know who Yehoshua is. How did it get so far off? People would rather believe what people say. Right. People would rather have the accolades of the world than the hand of Yahweh. That's what they desire. Unfortunately, <clears throat> okay, go back to Exodus. <laughs> I think we were in chapter 3 there, right? <clears throat> in uh, Verse 11, <clears throat> But Moshe said to Elohim, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Forty years earlier, he thought that he was the one that was supposed to you know, deliver. But now he's asking, But who am I? Verse 12, So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve Elohim on this mountain. When he brought the people out, right, and he brought them back down to Horeb, which is where he left from, wasn't it? And that's where he brought them. And that, you know, what happened in, in, in Mount, Mount Horeb? He served Yahweh in giving the people what? The Torah, the instructions for having life. They weren't in the land when they got it. They got it so that when they got to the land, they'd know how to live. He also told them, he said, if you break what this word said, the land will vomit you out. Didn't he say that? Right. 
we all hope to go into the promised land. <laughs> How do you think we're going to have to live when we get there? But if we don't believe, will we ever get there? So all of this going into the promised land then is based on our faith or our trust in what Yahweh's word said in the first place. You can't substitute commentaries for what his word says. Otherwise your faith is in what somebody else thinks. <laughs> you got to go back to what the word says so that your faith is in the true one. Verse 13. <clears throat> Or actually, you know, he said, but who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Those are, those are words of humility, not fear. Okay? <clears throat> he might have a fear of failure, you know, if he's not good enough or something like that, but it's really not because of he was afraid. <clears throat> and the sign of serving Elohim, okay, implies that all obstacles along the way you will return and serve me on this mountain. Because he said it. He's saying every obstacle that's going to come up is going to be removed and you're going to bring your people back to me right here. You believe that, nothing else is going to get in the way. Verse 13. <laughs> then Moshe said to Elohim, Indeed, when I come to the sons of Israel and say to them, Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? What shall I say to them? Remember all Moses learned, or all he knows is what he learned while he was down in Egypt and since he's been in Midian. And that, that's all he ever known, right? You know, they didn't have a Bible in every house. <laughs> Torah wasn't written yet. Right. Up to this point, everything that anybody had was just what? Word of mouth passed down. You have to pick, you know, who and what you believe, right? I mean, we don't really think about this sometimes as we're reading this, you know, going through Genesis and all the way through, but these people are living the Word as it's being written for us. Those who are first shall be last, and those who are last shall be first. We're going to get some of this first instruction, the first understanding before they do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Verse 14. Elohim said to Moshe, I most think this Bible say, I am, you know, who I am. But we all know that says, Yahweh said, Eye, Ashir, Eye. <clears throat> Meaning, I will be who I will be. And Eye, that number 1961, the root of it is Haya, which means to be or to become or to exist or to come into being. He was, he is, he will be. In the beginning, he was the Word. In the Word, he was with Yahweh, and the Word, he was Yahweh. I will be who I will be. He will be whatever his Word says he's going to become. Okay? Isn't that what he's saying? <clears throat> Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I will be has sent me to you. A yeah has sent me to you. Eye, 1961. <laughs> Hayah. And remember the name Yahweh? Is what, 3068? What's the root of it? Hayah. Eye, this 1961 is the root. In verse 15 it says, Moreover, Elohim said to Moshe, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, Elohe of your fathers, Elohe of Abraham, Elohe of Yitzhak, and Elohe of Yaakov has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. <laughs> Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, Elohe of your fathers, Elohe of Abraham, of Yitzhak, and of Yaakov appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. So he's saying, go back and tell them, you know, I will be who I will be. You're looking for a name. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be whoever I want to be. Gods always have names because they are applied to certain particular things so people can see that and say, okay, that's my God. How many gods do they have in India by how many different names? Thousands of them. And the thing about it is today when people say, I worship God, you ever look at them and say, what's the name of the one you call God? 
what God do you worship? Do you think that all of us worship the same thing because we, you know, everybody calls him God? So what is the name? Who is your? <laughs> the one you are. Who is? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I will be who I will be. Who is the one that we worship? Is it us? We worship what we want to do? <clears throat> Back up in that word in verse 15. He said, This is my name forever. His memorial to all generations. My name forever. My Shemot. Name forever. Shema. Shem. That root. Memorial to all generations. Okay. <clears throat> and then in verse 16, Yahweh is spelled Yod Heh Vav Heh. 3068, we'll find it in Strong's, and it comes from 1961. And what did it say? I will be who I will be. And that yeah is 1961, it's the root of the name Yahweh. I will be who I will be. <clears throat> the root of means the existing one. Who was the father of David? Jesse, right? And the name Jesse means what? He exists. Because not Jesse, it's Yeshi. He exists. <clears throat> okay. I won't, I won't go into that right now. Verse 17. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Yebusites to a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> then they will heed your voice and you shall come. You and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, Yahweh, Elohei of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh, Elohim. He said, go tell him you're going to be gone three days. When Pharaoh told him, okay, you can go, and then he got all of his troops to go after him and bring them back is when he broke his work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he brought the punishment upon himself. We don't ever stop and think about it. Sometimes we give our word to somebody and then we don't keep it. Right. And yet we're trying to say we're trying to be like him. Do we expect him to keep his word? Yeah. Why? <laughs> so are we going to be measured in that same respect? These little bitty things, I've been trying to get people to think about it. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But we need to understand that the smallest thing that we, we live by day to day to day. You know, we can't even get along with one another if we don't have faith or trust in one another. That's a tough thing when you stop and think about it. You know, if you say it, mean it. If you don't mean it, don't say it. Verse 19. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not even by a mighty hand. Now, before he ever goes into Pharaoh, Yahweh's telling him he ain't going to let you go. So, I mean, whatever comes to pass, you ought to be prepared. <laughs> <coughs> But he told him he's going to go on a three days journey. He warns him that Pharaoh's not going to let him go. And then in verse 20 he says, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in its midst. And after that he will let you go. He said he's going to tell you no and then I can operate and then finally he's going to let you go. Verse 21, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. This, uh, this verse, if you want to just put a little ring around it, is a very important verse to understand that when the people went out and they asked them for things, you know, they inquired or they requested of them, they didn't go borrow anything. They didn't go demand anything. They just went and asked. Because Yahweh had given them favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and the Egyptians, what? Gave them, which is a blessing. You don't bless somebody if you say, here, I'm going to give it to you, but I want it back. <laughs> you know, a blessing is something you give without expecting anything back, right? So he blessed them. The promise to Abraham was what? Those who bless you, I will bless. His plan is for Egypt anyway. So understanding this verse then, is to help us understand the others and realize that there's got to be something wrong and said they went out and borrowed. They didn't borrow anything. 
And then when we see the verses, well, they spoiled the Egyptians. No, they didn't spoil them or plunder them or anything else. Yahweh gave them favor. <coughs> you don't know go plunder if somebody's giving you favor and they're giving it to you freely. You didn't plunder them. You know, they just gave you something freely. It changes the whole concept of understanding what Yahweh is doing. <clears throat> Verse 22. I don't know if any of them have translations that have the word borrow in there. Does anybody reading the word borrow? In, in that verse uh, uh, 21. The number is 7592. The word itself actually means to request. It has nothing to do with borrowing. <clears throat> Verse 22, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall, it's not plunder, is it? It's the number 5337, not Saul. So you shall deliver the Egyptians. Really? Yeah. So plunder sounds like take away. I know. With force. I know, but that's because the translator gave you what he thought. It's not what the word actually says. Okay? The word plunder is the word in that saw, 5337. Now that word that translated plunder in that verse appears in Scripture 212 times. Okay? In 210 times, <laughs> the word is always translated in agreement with the meaning to snatch from danger, to rescue or to save. Did you say deliver? To deliver, right. Not saw. To deliver or to snatch away. Okay? Well, the word plunder is a, is a translator's yeah. rendering. It's got nothing to do with the meaning of the word. Well, that means deliver, though. Like snatch away. To plunder? Yeah. No, plunder means steal from you. Okay? So that word's not supposed to be in there. No, the word not, you know, put a better word in it. So you shall deliver. Save or deliver. Or save or use, you know, anything better than, than that. But just for a second, go back to Genesis 12. You know, one of the things that I, that I think a lot of people miss in, in Bible study and in Bible reading and so forth, they start out, you know, maybe reading in Genesis, but you don't pick up the things that you learn and the things that, you know, you take what he said was and you, you take it to heart and then later on down the road you say, oh, okay, this is what he meant, this is where it's applied, okay? Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. What does he say? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses. I will bless him. I will bitterly curse him who lightly esteems you, is what it says in Hebrew. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In who? Abraham. Who are all these descendants he's talking to over here in Exodus? The sins of Abraham, right? So it makes sense then. He's going to give them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, right? And you're just going to go ask, and they're going to just give it to you. Right? Maybe some of that stuff over there in, in, in the New Testament where he says, you don't have because you ask not. <laughs> or, you know, you ask because you want to spend it on your lust rather than something else, okay? So I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people don't have things, but most of it is because all they can read is one little verse and never go back and look at anything that explains what has to happen in order for that to operate, you know? If you want to get juice out of battery, you got to put some wires on it. Yeah, I mean, there's something you got to hook up to make it work. Okay? <clears throat> now, back over in, in Exodus there in verse 21, he plainly said, I will give this people favor. You don't have to go borrow from them. You don't have to go steal from them. You don't have to go, you know, do anything. You just, you're going to get it. They're going to give it to you. The enemy of the people, who owned all the people? Pharaoh. He owned everything. He owned the land. He owned the people. You know, the enemy is not the people. It's Pharaoh. Okay? Go with me to De Deuteronomy 23. <coughs> Verse 7. I mean, this kind of an instruction is not something Yahweh would give to us, the children of Israel, concerning an enemy, right? 
Verse 7, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. We were strangers in his land, and they what? They gave us favor, therefore we shall not abhor them, right? <laughs> what about the Edomites? <coughs> you know, we have to decide whether we like them or not. We know what they did, right? But I hope everybody doesn't hold it against us or what our parents or our foreparents did, right? Or, or you know, somebody, hey, you know, I'm not them, <laughs> right? <clears throat> okay, going back to Exodus. <clears throat> Chapter 4. Well, this is going fast, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> Then Moshe answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, Yahweh has not appeared to you. I mean, he's looking ahead, isn't he? So uh, Yahweh said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. The rod, in verse 2, the number is 4294. It's the Hebrew word mate, M A T T E H, mate. <clears throat> Otherwise, it means a branch, okay, like a tree limb branch. Literally, literally, it means a rod for correction, a scepter for ruling, a staff for walking, a lance for throwing. Yeah. yeah. But it also has figurative meaning, you know. You know, not everything can be taken literally, sometimes, you know, figuratively. But the figurative meaning of it is, it means a support of life. A support of life. I.e., bread, a branch, also means a tribe. Now, in the rod, and I, you know, when I started out, I said the book of Exodus contains many, many symbols of things, okay? When we begin to start looking for all these symbols and what they represent, then, then a whole lot of it begins to come, you know, unfold to us. So in the rod, we see many symbols of the Messiah in union with Moshe and Aaron. Moshe uses the rod to perform miracles. Aaron uses the rod to perform miracles, okay? All of these things point to Messiah Yehoshua. Okay, Yosef, not Yosef, Yehoshua won the battle down in the valley fighting as long as, you know, Moshe was supported and they held up the rod, right? And as long as the rod was held up, Yehoshua won the battle. Who is the rod? Him. In Mark, Messiah told us, the word of Yahweh, what, is made of no effect by the traditions of men. Whenever you throw away the word of Yahweh, now you're trying to hold up something else and it won't support it. <laughs> anyway, I think it's kind of interesting. Okay. So in verse 3, And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moshe fled from it. The rod became a serpent. Now, isn't it kind of strange to think about the rod representing Messiah becoming a serpent? But we're going to see on, on later on, you know, when what? <clears throat> the serpent became a symbol for sin, right? Hasatan. What was the symbol for the nation of Egypt? It was a serpent. You know, we've had the helmets and everything, you know, that Pharaoh wore, you know, and what was the big symbol upon his helmet and everything? It was a serpent. Pharaoh again then, with Egypt, the world, is a picture of Hasatan, okay? <clears throat> Who is false messiah, antichrist. The individual or the political entity. If we go through the book of Daniel, he points to all these different nations that he refers to as Antichrist, right? And he says, who is the god of that world? Hasatan, <laughs> the serpent, okay? Again, we have these symbols of pictures, okay? And it makes, you know, I'm not saying there's not an individual somewhere who leads all this thing, but the thing about it is it's an organized system of the world which comes against Yahweh. How many people right now want us to follow and walk in obedience to the Torah? What do you mean you can't work on Saturday? Just what I said, I ain't working on Saturday. You know, I mean, you know, 
Do anybody remember the blue laws they passed in this country a few years back, you know, when you could go down, you could buy certain things on Sunday, but you couldn't buy something kind of like you could buy a milk bottle, you know, or a baby bottle on Sunday, but you can't buy the rubber nipples? I mean, all kinds of these rules. Why did they do that? I mean, if the world really didn't care, you know, all they're trying to do is try and make it hard, right? And, and, and why were they pushing these blue laws anyway? Who was doing it? It wasn't the believers. They, I mean, non-believers, they don't care. So it was people who were what thought they were believers, they were pushing some kind of false doctrines. <clears throat> anyway, he became a serpent, and Moshe fled from him. The word serpent there is the number 5175. It's the word nachash. It means a snake from the hiss, the sound that it makes. It's exactly the same word in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and the use of the serpent that tempted Eve, or Chava. It's the same word in Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, where it talks about the copper serpent that was hung on a pole. Okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, we don't have to go there, just make a little note. We're told that Yehoshua was made to be sin. And just like the rod was made to be the serpent and swallowed up the other serpents in the flesh, Messiah was made to be sin and hung on a pole, and in doing so, he swallowed up all the other sins in the flesh. Okay? The thing about it is, when we go back, you know, it talks about later, but the, you know, the other two sorcerers of Pharaoh, they could do some of them same things, right? Make their snakes eat snakes, you know. But Messiah's snake, I mean, Moses' snake swallowed up theirs, right? So where is the real strength? And so many people follow after those others over there because they've never seen the power of the original, the real. Verse 4, Then Yahweh said to Moshe, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. He reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. <clears throat> The word of Yahweh is life to those who what? Who are trained by it, but it's death to those who rebel against it. Isn't that what it said? Verse 5, that they may believe that Yahweh, the Elohe of their fathers, the Elohe of Abraham, the Elohe of Yitzhak, and the Elohe of Yaakov has appeared to you. This was a sign that, that Yahweh gave to Moshe so that the people would know that, you know, who appeared to it. I mean, if we're not seeing here back in Exodus then a picture of the Messiah to come and remove the sin of the world by becoming sin, you know, then we really never have really studied anything. Because we have Messiah talking to us over there. Messiah himself said, as Moses lifted up the serpent on the pole in the wilderness, so the Messiah must be lifted up. We're told that, right? So we have that connection. It is amazing how much Yehoshua, in, in studying and reading his words, and we go back and read the Torah, we're beginning to get the insight, but you can't have one without the other. Verse 6. <laughs> but just think, when he threw down the rod, right, and it became a serpent, okay? The serpent in the free state brings death. Right? But the serpent in the hand of Moses became the breath of life or the staff of life. <laughs> I think that's kind of an interesting concept. Go to Isaiah chapter 4. I'm reading these things because I, I like to think that Isaiah and some of these other prophets and the writings that they wrote, they had the same understanding from the Torah that we're receiving, you know. In verse 2 it says, In that day the branch, the Matab, Yahweh, shall be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth will be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass, he who is left in Zion, he who remains in Jerusalem, will be called holy or set apart. Everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem, when Yahweh has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst, 
by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Then Yahweh will create above every dwelling place of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a covering. And there will be a tabernacle for shade in the daytime from the heat for a place of refuge and for a shelter from storm and rain. And all this is established because of what reason? His word said it. His word will bring itself to pass. <clears throat> Go to Second Corinthians chapter two. Verses 14 through 17. She said, Now thanks be to Yahweh, who always leads us in triumph in the Mashiach, and through us diffuses or manifests the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to Elohim the fragrance of the Mashiach among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death to death, and to the other the aroma of life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? What this is saying is that we are exactly representing the same thing, you know, that Moshe represented to Pharaoh with the serpent. In his hand, you know, it's life, but it's free, it's death. Verse 17, For we are not, as so many, peddling or adulterating for gain the word of Yahweh, but as of sincerity, but as of from Elohim, we speak in the sight of Elohim in the Mashiach. How many people out there right now are trying to use his word to make a profit, to make a fortune? I've been told, man, if you go get a degree, you know, you can make a fortune. Yeah. I didn't get into this because I want to get a fortune. <laughs> didn't really do it because I wanted to in the first place. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Go back to, to, to that, you know, in verse 5 again. That they may believe, okay? These were signs that were given to Moses so that the people would believe that he was sent by Yahweh. In verses 6 through 8, it says, Furthermore, Yahweh said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom and behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Then it will be if they do not believe you nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry and the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry. I mean, when we get into Egypt, you know, and he goes down and he takes his staff and he touches the, the, the Nile River and it turns to blood, you know, and then everything, all the water they had anywhere in the world turned to blood. And what did the, what did the magicians do? They went down and found some more water that was still good to drink. What did they do with it? Turned it into blood. I mean, these are, you know, smart folks, right? Kind of like the, all the frogs and they went and what, made some more frogs or something. <laughs> anyway. Verse 10, then Moshe said to Yahweh, <laughs> before we go on into that one, go to, go to uh, Luke 5. In the uh, <clears throat> verses 12 through 15. I'm hoping that this is not going to seem like a stretch when we talk about this, but, but he put his hand inside, you know, and he took it out and it was leprous and he put his hand back in and it was healed. Who did the making of the leprosy and who did the healing? Yeah. Yahweh did, okay? Moses is going to carry this thing as a sign, so it's through the writings of Moses that this thing comes to be. The Word made flesh, Messiah, Hoshua, what did he do? He healed people that were stricken with the leprosy. Okay? In Luke 5, in uh, verse 12, 
And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Yehoshua, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Master, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Is Yahweh, Yehoshua, not willing? He is willing, isn't he? And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. So again, this leprosy is a symbol of Yahweh. The sign when he was here, how many times did he heal people of leprosy? All of these things were pictures and signs of who he was. You see what I'm saying? They didn't recognize him because they didn't believe the Torah. And yet it was the Torah that prophesied not only Moses and the Word bringing these things, but it was Yahweh doing the work. And Messiah himself said what? It's the what? The Father in me who does the works. And the Father is the Word. And the Word does what it says. Brings this stuff to pass. I, that to me is an amazing concept if people could ever get a hold of it. Go to John 10. In uh, verse 37 and 38. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Remember, he's telling Moses, these are the signs that show that, that I sent you. He said, if I, do, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Believe the works anyway that are the Father. Right? <clears throat> Go to John 14. Mm -hmm. 10 and 11. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? I mean, as many times as, as we're you know reading these words, there were a lot of people who didn't believe who he was. You know, you know his own people around him. And I said, well, we know his family. We know his father and his mother. We know his brothers and his sisters. You know, he, he's the son of a carpenter. You know, he ain't nobody. <laughs> Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. The Father who dwells in him, what dwelled in him? The Word. The Word is spirit. The Father is a spirit. These words are spirit. The words I speak to you, he said, they are spirit and they are life. Verse 11, he said, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He said, Nobody comes to me because they didn't know the Father. If they had known the Father, they would have known Him. Isn't that what he was saying? we got to learn that they are one and the same. And the only place we can go to learn that is where? Through what the Torah says. And as we study Torah in these passages of Scripture and the things that he's talking to, he was talking to people probably who are supposed to have known the Torah, right? People who've never even read a sentence in the Torah and they try to accept somebody they call Jesus and read all these New Testaments and build a life on, on commentary, where is the foundation for understanding? It's not there. That's why he has so many different ideas and thoughts and designs and denominations and all this kind of stuff because people don't know what the foundation for it really is. Go back to that verse 9 again. If they don't believe the first two signs, which is what? The snake and the leprosy. Then what? <clears throat> the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry. Go back to John in chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 1 of John chapter 2. On the third day, <laughs> there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. 
and the mother of Yehoshua was there. Now both Yehoshua and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Yehoshua said to him, They have no wine. Yehoshua said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Is he being facetious or just letting us know that what he's fixing to do is not the ultimate? His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do. I guess we can obey Miriam, can't we? <laughs> I guess she said whatever Messiah said, do. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Yehudi containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Yehoshua said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out now and take to the master of the feast. And they took. When the master of the feast had tasted the water, it was made wine and did not know where it came from.